Hello, everyone, and welcome to Abralina Vivu Linguists Online. My name is Vera Gurbanova. I am Associate Professor in Linguistics at Stanford University. Abralina Vivu Linguists Online is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association and is designed to give students and researchers free access to state of the art discussions on the most diverse topics related to the study of language. It is my very great pleasure to introduce Jason Merchant, Professor in the Department of Linguistics at Chicago University currently serving there as Vice Provost. Jason Merchant received his PhD from uh, UC Santa Cruz in 1999 with a truly field-changing dissertation on the nature of ellipsis. One of the lasting arguments made in the dissertation and subsequently in his 2001 book, The Syntax of Silence, is that ellipsis uh, contains unpronounced syntactic structure and that the licensing of constituent ellipsis requires mutual entailment modulo focus between a linguistic antecedent and the elided material. This line of work also introduced a series of patterns and puzzles about the behavior of elliptical constructions, which continue to motivate important analytical developments in the field and push forward our understanding of the interaction between syntax, semantics, pragmatics, phonology. Dr. Merchant's enduring contributions have given rise to productive and insightful arguments and his mentorship has given rise to a mushrooming of work in ellipsis, much of it by junior scholars. In Dr. Merchant's work and in the work of the lively and engaged community that has formed around it, we find investigations that challenge and question what we think we know about the syntax, phonology, and semantics of silence. Today, Dr. Merchant will be speaking on ellipsis, how syntax movement and focus play roles. Please remember that uh, questions can be asked using the chat feature on the website. Uh, now I'll hand it over to Dr. Jason Merchant. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to everybody for joining me here today and to the organizers of the Abralin Ao Vivo uh, series, because I think this is um, not just in COVID times, but at any time, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to speak to a very large audience and to, um, and to uh, document and save those, um, these speeches for, uh, for later use. Um, so I, I decided um, uh, to not uh, concentrate necessarily on the most recent research, I wanted to give talk a little bit about why we study, why we should study ellipsis, what makes it interesting to, uh, you know, a practicing syntactician or a grammarian more generally, what the issues are around it, why it's so fascinating, what I think is the reason that it's such a, a useful tool to probe grammatical relations. Uh, and then I will uh, try to end with um, talking about some recent work. So if I, um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen right now. So you should be able to see um, let me see if I can make this go to, um, a slide. So, sorry. All right. I'm going to slide through it this way then. So I want to speak a little bit about the roles of syntax, uh, and movement and focus, um, and also, um, a little bit of the overall, um, what we've learned in the past 20 years, and perhaps why a grand unified theory will never be found. So I'm going to be presenting a lot of, uh, a lot of data from a lot of different domains, and I will be welcoming questions um, at the end. So the basic reason that I think ellipsis is interesting to study is because it tells us something a little bit about, or at least um, the analysis of it tells us something about the soul of syntax. In other words, what is in our syntax? Um, Here's a hypothesis about what syntax and syntactic relations look like. I'm going to call this hypothesis surfacism, right? We know we're going to need words and their parts. We're going to need phrase markers and some way of combining those words. And we're going to need some system to regulate the way that these um, words combine and the relations between them. Everyone agrees on this part. Uh, there's a further hypothesis, which is that we need something beyond surfacism, that we need something that I'll call abstract syntax, which is um, namely phonologically inactive versions of words and uh, phrase markers, right? So I think um, there are many ways to, to approach the question of whether or not such abstract syntax is actually necessary. Um, and ellipsis, of course, is the one that I'm gonna be looking at today. So here's the question. Is there syntactic structure that is unpronounced? Studying ellipsis is a little bit like studying black holes. It's my favorite metaphor for studying ellipsis because like black holes, we can't study them directly. That is, we can't put instruments and probe their properties by going inside them. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your slides. Oh no. I'm <laughs> sorry. That is no good. Uh, thank you for telling me. Um, let me try this again. I am on slide number three already and uh, 
I am clicking share my screen and I get the green box that says it's sharing. Let me stop the share and try again. I also don't see you, Vera, but I'm assuming that. Uh... That's intentional. I think I'm supposed to be invisible for while you're talking. Okay. Uh, hi, but yeah, we cannot see your slides. Hang on. You can hear me though. Yes. So I need to find <laughs> apologies for this. Too many Zoom windows open. Um, I'm sure this will work now. Famous last words, right? Uh, let's see, start, I wanna start the, uh, does that work? Yes, you can see them now. All right, hey. uh, you missed the first two slides, but that's okay. Um, I'm showing you a black hole now. And uh, just the metaphor here is that the way physicists study black hole, the way we learn about its properties by studying the things that are around it, the way it's, uh, it interacts with surrounding material. And largely that's our strategy when it comes to studying um, uh, ellipsis as well. Oh. All right, we use the old fashioned way. So let's give some um, backgrounds. Let's start with some basic facts. So Bill should collect butterflies, Jill should too. That's um, an elliptical sentence that contains what looks like a predicate ellipsis or verb phrase ellipsis. Uh, in English, the second clause is missing its, uh, its verb phrase. And it means something in this context as, as three does, right? That Jill should collect butterflies too. So that's what we're trying to explain. How is it that, some, that the words Jill should by themselves in this context seem to mean the same thing as Jill should collect butterflies? Where does that meaning come from? Um, and the second question that we'll be interested in is what is the relationship between that material that we just understood um, and an antecedent, All right? So here's one hypothesis that the VP um, is identical to the antecedent, right? Seems like a reasonable possibility in structure. The second possibility though, is that it's really recovered or resolved under some type of identity or parallelism for, from um, an actual or inferred antecedent. And the final possibility is, well, could be a lot of different things. It could be that that identity relationship is one that looks at um, the surface structure or it could be one that looks at the meanings that are generated or that the derivations are the same or that some kind of morpheme contingency is, is, uh, is computed. That's what I wanted to look at. Um, the, the second question, if we, if we take the project of studying ellipsis as being around um, establishing what the identity relation should be or the resolution to, call, to put it more neutrally, then we have to ask ourselves, well, in the case that we just saw, collect butterflies, it looks like we just need to grab those words or the meanings of those words and reuse them in some way, right? We have perfect identity between the antecedent meaning or structure and the one that we're alighting. Um, and so that gives rise to this question. The second question, is this kind of identity perfect? Um, the answer here is that it's apparently not perfect. And the reason that it's not perfect, it comes from 40 years of what I'll call mixed results. There are many, many cases like the one I just showed you where it looks like you get perfect matches, but, you, um, but there are also many cases where it looks like you get imperfect matches. And I just sort of threw up some of the, um, the kinds of data that people have come up with over the last 40 years in two charts here where, and I'll talk a little bit about the first, really just the first two sets at the top, voice and VP ellipsis and sluicing and uh, ellipsis under code switching. And in both cases, I'm gonna argue that uh, despite um, initial appearances, the identity really is perfect. Um, and what this means is that if uh, if the identity and if the identity has to be computed over syntactic structures uh, in some way, then we're going to have to claim, we're going to have to conclude then that these sort of abstract syntactic structures exist. So that's my goal here is to review the evidence that these abstract, i.e. unpronounced syntactic structures exist and that a kind of surfacist or wiki wig, right? What you hear is what you get uh, approach to syntax will not work. So let me flesh out these hypotheses very briefly first before getting into some of the details. So as we just said, right, hypothesis A, we'll call this the deletion hypothesis or the ellipsis hypothesis, the one that is unsurfacist, says that the reason Jill should in this context means Jill should collect butterflies is because there actually is an occurrence of the verb phrase collect butterflies. It just happens not to be pronounced. 
right? So that means the words are not really missing. What we need is a, is a theory of why those words don't come to be pronounced in that context. And once we have that theory, we get the meanings for free, right? The other po possibility is the one I just called WYSIWYG, right? Or WYSIWYG um, structure and that the missing words really are there, not there at all. That's the surfacist approach that would say, this sentence consists of a subject, an auxiliary verb should, and that's it. What you hear is what you get. Um, and you have to figure out some other way to generate the meaning. Okay, this has given rise to a huge amount of research. Um, I'm just or organize a few pieces of this in this chart. I'm not showing you this chart to, to try to say that these are uh, by any means comprehensive. This is just a, a selection of, of relevant um, references. The reason I'm showing you the chart is to, is to make it very clear that the two questions that we're talking about here um, are separate. The, is there syntax in the ellipsis site? That's across the top. And is identity syntactic or semantic? That's across the side, right? So you can answer those two questions independently in some cases and come to different conclusions. A lot of the earlier literature, I think, conflated the two, right? So people who were arguing for syntactic identity and syntactic ellipsis uh, were battling or, or arguing against people who are arguing for semantic identity, who took it then to mean that there's no syntax on the ellipsis site. But proving that there's some syntactic identity, I'm sorry, proving that there's some semantic identity required does not tell us actually anything about whether or not there's syntax. We need syntactic arguments for that. And I wanna provide you with some of the kinds of syntactic arguments that people have talked about today. So here are some of the domains of evidence. Um, there are lots of domains and I, obviously I won't go through all of them today. And in fact, there's more than I just put here. I ran out of room on the slide. Um, so there's lots of reasons to believe that the, the ellipsis site is syntactically active in two ways. It behaves as though it's there for relations of things that are outside of it, right? And it triggers or allows movement of things that are inside of it to position outside. So we're, we're, we find the effects on things around the ellipsis site that is elements that have been moved or agreement uh, controllers behaving as though there was syntax inside the ellipsis site. And that's, that's the black hole uh, argument. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about just th three or four of these. I'm not gonna try to get through all of them, um, starting with lower origin effects. So lower origin effects are cases where we have something outside of an ellipsis site whose origin seems to have been low, i.e. seems to have been inside the ellipsis site. So in order to understand this argument very briefly, we'll come back to it. We need to start out with something like null complement anaphora. Null complement anaphora does not appear to involve ellipsis um, and we do not find movement dependencies that resolve into or whose feet or trace, uh, if you will, um, are inside the uh, putative ellipsis site. So, Take an example like nine, we asked Anna to review these five films and she agreed. What's interesting about this is that she agreed means she agreed to review them, right? There's a, there's a dependency in meaning here, um, which gives rise to the question, is there also some ellipsis? I mean, sorry, is there also some syntax um, after the verb agree? We know that agree can take a infinitiva clause in here, can also take a, a, a tense CP. Um, but what we can't do is something like 10. We know which film, I'm sorry, we need to know which films Anna refused to review and which one she agreed, right? That doesn't work at all. Even though we could imagine what it would mean, it would be which one she agreed to review. This is very different from the behavior of VP ellipsis under this verb, which, um, and a verb like refuse and agree both allow for VP ellipsis in, the, in their infinitival complements. And here we can see a very simple contrast. So in 15, we see we need to know which films Anna refused to review and which one she agreed to, or we need to know which films Anna agreed to review and which one she refused to. In both of these, we have a, a, a WH phrase, which ones, meaning which films, which whose origin site, which is the object of an understood verb review, right? The only problem is that in 15, that verb review in the second clause after, after the conjunct is not pronounced, it's not there. So, the question for us is where did it come from? And the answer that the ellipsis theorist gives is that the verb phrase is there um, as you see in 16. The box verb phrase review has a verb, it has an object, that object is subject to WH movement in a language like English and it undergoes WH movement. And then, or concomitantly I should say, there's no necessary derivational ordering here, but concomitantly that verb phrase is subject to ellipsis. And that means we don't pronounce in this case the only material that's left in the verb phrase, which is the verb itself, review, All right? So this, this pattern of facts makes perfect sense if verb phrase ellipsis 
involves syntax, active syntax, which can be extracted from, and null complement effort does not, right? Then there's no way to generate 14. Someone who doesn't believe that there's any difference between 15 and 14 has to provide an example, I'm sorry, has to provide an analysis for why WH extraction is okay in 15, but not in 14. That analysis, as far as I know, has not been provided. All right, another kind of lower origin effect. We just saw WH movement, A bar movement. Um, 17 is a, is a different kind of A bar movement that uh, involves um, uh, a topicalization of the title of uh, Cicero's um, work on friendship, uh, De Amicitia. And um, as you can see, it is the object of the verbs of, sorry, of the preposition uh, at in make a stab at. Um, and could have, if you read 17, the, the, um, where you see the, the large delta, the triangle, that um, indicates the missing verb. Now, if you consider this for a second, you'll realize that de amicitia has to have extracted from both conjuncts, otherwise it would be violating um, the coordinate structure constraint. And in order for that to happen, there must be an extraction site inside that delta as well. Another um, set of facts that we're gonna come back to in, in much greater detail later uh, involves head movement um, out of ellipsis sites. So I give you two examples here from Irish and from, uh, and from Russian uh, from, from Vera's own work. So in Irish, remember Irish is a VSO language with no um, pro drop and no, otherwise, uh, no other argument drop. Um, and it allows sentences like 18, uh, literally said I that I would buy it and bought, meaning I bought it, I did it. Um, uh, and in 19, um, a Russian uh, variant of that, that involves um, two verbs that are, uh, are, that are in, in contrast with each other. Um, and all of the arguments of those, of the second verb in particular missing. Now McCloskey has suggested in, in this very important paper that the reason you generate something like 18 is because the verb in Irish moves high, moves out of the verb phrase, um, and that the verb phrase, which includes the, um, the subject here, is subject to uh, ellipsis. So that means that in, in, in uh, Irish, verb phrase ellipsis looks very funny because the verb remains, but the subject does not. Um, so they're very different from English and something similar, um, Vera has argued is going on in 19. We'll come back to those um, at the end. Another kind of vocality effect is uh, a traditional island effect. So if you look at 20, I read every book you introduced me to a guy who did, right? What we have here is, an, is a relative clause, a relativized over book with an um, implicit operator here after book, um, whose, uh, whose origin site has to be inside the verb phrase and that's missing. Um, the verb phrase here meaning something like read, uh, but Unfortunately, that verb phrase is inside a relative clause itself, namely the relative clause started by who, uh, and that we know is an island. So we understand 20A to be um, unacceptable because it would involve extraction of a relative operator out of a relative clause, which as Ross showed in his dissertation is, is not listed in English. So it's equivalent to, I read every book, you introduced me to a guy who read, uh, which is bad. Um, and similar types of um, examples in B, C, and D. Um, it's sometimes said that that uh, that sluicing repairs islands. That was a VP ellipsis case, but it's it's not entirely true. It's really only certain types of sluicing. In fact, we we retain some um, uh, locality effects when we look at contrast sluicings, like in twenty one. She knows a guy who has five dogs, but I don't know how many cats. What's crucial here is not that it's ungrammatical because it's it's not obviously. It's that it only has one of the two possible meanings here, or or. Um, what we might expect to be possible meanings. It has a meaning where it means, I don't know my, how many cats that guy has, he or he has, something like that. But it doesn't, it can't mean, I don't know how many cats she knows a guy who has, right? And so these, these seem to show again that there is some movement out of, um, out of the ellipsis site uh, and that that movement is constrained by uh, normal grammatical and syntactic um, conditions. All right. Let me talk another, another type of ex uh, example, another type of argument comes from agreement. Now, agreement, it's crucial for this argument uh, that we're making here today about syntax that we look at syntactically controlled agreement. Um, and so obviously agreement is very complicated and there's a lot of um, semantic effects of agreement as well. Um, so I, what I wanna do is look at a case where the semantics and syntax of agreement come apart 
or rather the syntax and semantics of number come apart. And we see in a language like English, of course, that um, subject verb agreement is controlled by morphosyntactic agreement features, not by semantic number directly. Um, and uh, the, you know, the best place to see something like this come apart is in, a, is in words which are pluralia tantum, right? Only plural. So uh, English um, nuptials is such a word. It's a synonym for wedding. It's a you know, high register synonym. It means wedding. Um, and so uh, if you look at examples 22 and 23, you can see these are the 22 and 23 are synonyms, right? They're true in all the same situations. Beth's wedding was in Bond, Rachel's wedding was in Rockefeller, Beth's nuptials were in Bond, and Rachel's nuptials were in Rockefeller. Um, the only difference, of course, is that because nuptials was plural tantum, we get verb agreement um, in the plural in 23. All right. Now, um, what you can't do, no matter how much you want to think of your wedding as a um, singular event, um, if you describe that wedding with the word nuptials, you cannot use singular agreement. That's what it means to be plurality tantum in this case. 29 is ungrammatical because Rachel's nuptials was, is not, does not show the expected and necessary morphosyntactic agreement. English, uh, like many other languages, has ellipsis in the noun phrase. Um, in particular, it has nominal ellipsis after possessives. So you can also say things like 30 and 31. Rachel, Beth's nuptials were in Bond Chapel and Rachel's were in Rockefeller, right? Again, in this context, what, what, the word that's missing here, the noun that's missing is wedding or nuptials. And it's crucial that it's that noun with its morphosyntactic properties, because if you try to switch, you get ungrammaticality. So 37, Beth's nuptials were in Bond Chapel and Rachel's was in Rockefeller doesn't work. And now what, let, think about for a moment why this doesn't work. It's because the word nuptials is what's been elided in 37. And that word has a morphosyntactic feature plural. So the group verb has to agree with it. It can't, it's not just the meaning of nuptials or wedding that, that is recovered in 37. Because if that were enough, you might expect to find, I don't know, either agreement possible, depending on which word was uh, was thought of, or maybe just singular if um, if weddings um, are always, you know, they denote singular events. Um, so this is a, a rough schematic of what the um, of what the analysis would be. Um, and you can see this is this gives rise to the expected pattern uh, to the attested pattern. It's the verb is in the plural because nuptials is in the plural. And again, it's contingent on someone who doesn't believe that there's any noun in this structure to, to explain why the antecedent noun is triggering subject agreement in a separate clause. That is a kind of long distance agreement we do not usually see. All right, our next argument comes from case. Many languages have arbitrary case, including German. So, um, and this our particular argument goes back to, to a paper by Ross in 1969, um, where he compared uh, words that come from very similar um, semantic domains, like uh, threaten and praise, both take um, uh, animate objects, human cognitive objects, um, but threaten in German, drohen, uh, assigns the dative case, as those of you who have studied German know, it's a pain to have to memorize all this stuff. Lots of languages make it painful um, for foreign learners like me to, uh, to, to get it right. Um, most verbs in this class would, be, would behave like loben in 39, which assigns the um, accusative. So what's crucial here is that that, of course, uh, uh, that case assignment works on the WH words, even if they're moved away, right? Case, syntactic case is not contingent on being local to a verb um, at uh, the moment of pronunciation. So veem in 38 is the who, and veen with an N is, um, is who in 39, as you'd expect. So what Ross pointed out is that if you do sluicing, if you do ellipsis of the sentential part of this question, you get the same effect. I mean, you get the same pattern. So in 40, veem is the only acceptable um, sluiced WH word here with the dative case. And in 41, veen is the only one. And that's, why is that? That's because um, what these two words have gotten their case assignment from an unpronounced version of the verb threaten or praise. And so their case properties are exactly the same as in their non-elliptical counterparts. Here's, you know, again, I'm just giving you a very schematic type verb, uh, sorry, schematic type analysis. 
very old fashioned circa 1969, but you, you get the point. The reason you have veem is because there's a verb drohen in the structure. And the reason you have veem is because you have the verb ruin. Again, on a WYSIWYG analysis or a or WYSIWYG, um, the question is why do you have these case properties since there's no local verb to do the case assignment? Well, this case has been analyzed um, by previous um, work, uh, for example, in Kolikover and Jackendorf uh, and Ginsberg and Sag, they introduce a, uh, a special feature to attach to the NP. Uh, Ginsberg and Sag call it salient utterance. Um, really, probably better would be something like, you know, salient correlate. Um, and it says, well, if you have something that looks like this, you have to find a correlate. And then instead of getting case in a normal way, you get case through an inheritance mechanism that tags it to the correlate, right? So the, the crucial thing is becomes the nature of the correlate relation. This is a little bit, this strikes me as, a, as, a, as an unconvincing move to make uh, precisely because normally we do have a relationships, grammatical relationships that do involve features, feature sharing uh, between noun phrases in one sentence and noun phrases in another anaphoric um, devices in another sentence. What they're claiming is that this is a special kind of anaphoric device that picks up um, case from its correlate or antecedent. Uh, that's not the case for the the you know the most well studied anaphoric device, namely pronouns. Um, pronouns uh, have the case properties that they um, that they do in their local context. They may have um, five features that agree with their antecedents, but case is not a five feature, right? It's not person, number, or gender, and so there's no agreement in case um, found in typical anaphoric cross clausal anaphoric uh, relations. All right. So the second case I want to, the next case I want to talk about comes from code switching. So um, code switching, of course, involves uh, switching from one code, one language or register uh, to another, um, usually midstream and within a, a single utterance. Uh, so here's an example that comes um, uh, from the work of Kai Gonzalez uh, from Spanish and German. So in 44, we have an antecedent Juan amenazó a alguien, aber ich weiß nicht wem Juan gedroht hat. So uh, the person switches from Spanish halfway and then at the, at the conjunction switches into German and continues in German. Um, what, uh, what Gonzalez noticed is that if you uh, code switch twice, you find an interesting property of case assignment. So the, the verb amenazar in Spanish assigns accusative. Um, as we saw the German equivalent assigns a dative, that's in 44. Um, when you use amenazar with a German uh, noun phrase, the German noun phrase will appear in the accusative, as you'd expect, because the noun, I'm sorry, the, the verb, um, the Spanish verb is assigning the accusative. Um, and that holds under WH movement as well. So 45, you get the expected veen, not veen, because it is the object of the Spanish verb amenazar, not of the German verb drohen, even though both mean um, threaten. So what Gonzalez and a student of his Sergio Ramos did was that they um, decided to put these together, put these facts together and look at sluicing where you would switch the two um, because they were precisely interested in this question of what's inside the ellipsis site. Is anything inside the ellipsis? And if so, what are its properties? So take a look at the examples in 46 and 47. These are their test sentences. They, uh, in 46, um, what they did was they used the beam, the dative, and in 47, the accusative. Now, why would they, uh, what, are the, what are the expectations around these two? In, uh, in 46, we, if the German, if, if what's being elided is the German verb drohen under some kind of identity with uh, the Spanish verb amenazar, then we might expect the dative to be um, possible or perhaps even required. In 47, on the other hand, uh, if the accusative who is possible, then what we're um, what we have to conclude is that uh, there is no verb that's elided which is um, assigning the the dative case. Um, and if it's in fact the only thing possible, then we're also we can conclude something stronger, which is no German verb could possibly be elided under these conditions. So what they found is this. Right. They found that very high ratings, acceptability ratings for the accusative um, 
of the two examples I just showed you, both the uh, non-elliptical version that continues in Spanish entirely after Wien, uh, as well as the Sluist version, those both got a four. And um, the German uh, was the dative, I should say, in that context was very low. Um, if you continue in German, then German speakers, I mean, these code switching speakers, bilingual Spanish German speakers, um, as expected, completely require um, the dative. In other words, to present the data in a slightly different format, um, 48 is not possible for these speakers, while 49 is the only thing that's possible. So 48 is the dative um, that we saw, and, it, uh, and 49 is the accusative. What this indicates is that the analysis must be as indicated. That is, in 48, we seem to be trying to allied a German verb under um, identity with a Spanish verb, and that doesn't seem to be licit. Uh, whereas in 49, um, we are forced essentially to code switch back into Spanish in order to take the properties of the Spanish verb on and use them to get the vein. All right. So this gives rise to an interesting uh, hypothesis, namely that all of these kind of cross-language ellipses really involve code switching at the ellipsis site. Cross-language, I should say, these cross-language code switching under ellipsis has been studied since the 70s, uh, particularly for pairs like Spanish and English. Um, I decided to look at them with Greek-English um, bilinguals, uh, particularly because this is a kind of a situation that arises often in my family um, where my kids are, are Greek-English bilinguals. Um, and this is an attested example of, uh, of something that uh, my son once said a few years ago, um, when he wanted to turn on the uh, air conditioning uh, in Greece one morning, and his mother said, what you see in A, 51A, so it means you, in the morning, the, there's no need for air conditioning, literally not, well, you can see, there, yeah, there is, it is not needed air conditioning in the accusative. Um, and uh, our son responded, yes, it does. Um, and uh, my wife said, drosula. it's a little cool. And my son said, no, it doesn't. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. So I wanted to give you one example of what this is going on. The second case in particular, take a look at this. So drosula. this is um, the verb have here. This is literally has coolness. It has, there's no um, overt um, expletives in Greek. Um, this is, a comp this is a, um, an existential structure. This is used for there are, there is um, in, in lots of other cases. Um, and one way to talk about uh, weather is to say there, there is coolness or you know, there is hot, there is heat, I should say. That's how you say it's hot out. Um, what's interesting is that the response in English is not something like, no, it isn't, but rather, no, it doesn't, right? Now, what is the structure of no, it doesn't, right? What is going on in this? bilinguals grammar. Um, it's, it's actually not so easy to see because almost all the options in English to, to continue the sentence don't work. In fact, it's impossible to finish the sentence. It's impossible to not do ellipsis here and complete the sentence in English and still come out acceptable, right? So 52A, no, it doesn't be a little cool, right? That doesn't work. You can't say it doesn't have a little coolness because English have doesn't have this existential reading that the Greek does. You can't say, no, there doesn't be uh, a little coolness, that's just as bad as A. Um, and you can't say, well, no, there isn't a little coolness. I mean, you could say it, but that's not what he said. Um, what's interesting uh, and different about Greek versus um, Spanish and English is that Greek does not have, modern Greek does not have any infinitival form of the verb. So there's no way to actually continue this with a Greek word either. You can't say, no, it doesn't Echidrosula or have, right? If there were an infinitival form of the verb have, you might expect it to show up here because that's the form you'd expect in in, uh, in English. And that's also the form you do get those in uh, in Greek, I'm sorry, in Spanish, English code switching context, you would get the Spanish infinitival here, right? It doesn't jugar or it doesn't haber or something like that. Um, but that's not what you get in Greek. So there's really nothing no way to complete the sentence. This is a kind of ineffability uh, effect. Um, there, you must do ellipsis and what's your, what you're lighting is um, something that is the Greek verb have, but in, its un, in an uninflected form. Now, I, I point this out not because I'm interested necessarily in, in 
telling you about the details of that analysis, but for our major point, which is how does someone who doesn't believe there's any structure here account for 52, right? The, the, the child's answer, no, it doesn't. Um, and in particular, how do you rule out something like 52G, right? No, it isn't, right? So if somebody says ehidrosula, it means it's a little cool out, um, but I can answer that. If, if they said that in English, I can answer by saying, no, it isn't. That's exactly how I'd have to do it if I wanted to do any ellipsis, right? Because that's the structure of the antecedent and the meaning is the same. But I can't do that with ellipsis in English given that Greek antecedent. What I can do is I can just code switch entirely into English. I'm not constrained by the fact that my interlocutor is speaking Greek. I can come back with a total English sentence in, in H and say, no, it isn't kind of cool, right? That's fine. Um, but I can't take that and reduce it in any way to yield G. And that's the puzzle because ellipsis is sensitive to more than just the meaning and the context. It's sensitive to the form of the antecedent in ways that would be surprising if there were no syntax in the ellipsis site. So what I wanna suggest is that in fact, what the ellipsis site contains is a Greek verb phrase with the root of the verb have, ech, which in Greek is unpronounceable. It must combine with, with some kind of um, set of endings. But in this particular case, because uh, ellipsis is applied, you don't have to combine it with anything because the, um, uh, the resulting structure is not ill-formed um, at PF. And this follows a line of thinking that I think was made most prominent by Andre Saab in his dissertation and subsequent work, um, looking at the, analyzing ellipsis as the lack of inserted uh, elements, which is very consistent with what's going on here. All right. Um, and 56 is just another cool fact. Um, but it's basically the same fact. This is an English only fact. It's a little cool today, but it didn't yesterday. It'll be a little cool today, but it didn't yesterday. Those are just terrible beyond belief. Um, and the question is why, right? Well, if we believe that the verb be is in 56, then we have the answer because, you know, it's the same answer we give to the sentence why it's bad to say it didn't be cool yesterday, right? B doesn't allow do support. Now, you have to have a theory of that, sure. Um, there's lots of theories of why you can't, can't use do with, with B. Um, and whatever theory is correct can apply to 50, to rule out 56 A and B as well. That's my point. If, on the other hand, there's no uh, structure in A and B, no, no verb B in the second uh, clause in 56 A and B, then that, um, that line of uh, analysis is not available. Um, and it, 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 it behooves the analysts who believe that there's no syntax there at all to um, provide an explanation for why 56 um, uh, is ill-formed. All right, voice mismatches. This is a fun one. So going back to Sag, Sag 1976 in his um, very famous MIT dissertation uh, included examples like 57 and 58. Paul denied the charge, but the charge wasn't by his friends. John had observed many of the enemy soldiers, but hadn't been by them. Um, he, uh, he put stars on these and he said, uh, English verb phrase ellipsis uh, does not allow for switches in voice. And that was pretty much the, um, the opinio communis for 20 years until Dan Hart uh, in his dissertation in 1993 um, came along and did uh, enough, uh, did corpus studies uh, searches and found a whole number of examples where um, they seem to, this sort of switching seemed to be well formed. Um, I'll give you a couple here in 64 through 66, uh, uh, right? So some, many of these are, are uh, attested. Um, one that uh, I'll talk about a little bit more detail is, is 66. This problem must have been looked into, but obviously nobody did. Um, and this is an example that both Hart and, uh, and Andy Kaler talk about. Um, well, so, so this is interesting. This leaves us with a, a puzzle, right? The empirical ground has shifted. Um, it seems that in fact, these are, um, you know, these are fine, they're tested, but not just a test. I don't wanna make a fetishization out of, out of attestation because that's also wrong. They're really shown to be acceptable to, um, to native speakers of English, uh, not just produced, not just errors, but really 
basically acceptable. Um, and so the puzzle for Hart and, and for Kaler later was to find out why did SOG and earlier researchers think that they were bad? Well, it wasn't actually that hard to find because um, the, the examples in 62 and 66 have various other properties that um, make them um, unlike each other. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, on the other hand, sluicing, right? In sluicing, we get examples like 67. Joe was murdered, but we don't know who. Someone murdered Joe, but we don't know by whom. Right? These seem to be pretty unredeemably bad, right? Maybe in 20 years from now, we'll be saying the same things we did, you know, saying about SUG or Hart said about SUG, which was, yeah, they're not so bad. We just didn't find the right examples. That could be. Um, but in the meantime, they seem to be, they seem to contrast fairly strongly with their non-elliptical controls. And that's something that I think is one of the lessons we've learned over the last 20 years is that we always, always have to run the non-elliptical versions or variants to the extent possible to ensure that when we're studying ellipsis, that we're really studying ellipsis and not studying something else. Um, and so a lot of the work in the 70s and 80s, I think, um, didn't do this, didn't run these controls very carefully. And so they, they made lots of interesting discoveries, but they, and they attributed it to the theory of ellipsis or tried to explain it through the theory of ellipsis. And that, I think, it turned out to be not true, right? Chris Tancredi showed in his dissertation that almost all of the properties that we found with binding and with quantifier scope uh, effects, especially parallelism effects, were found equally in deaccented sentences. So what people had been really studying was um, cohesiveness relations that are, that are sensitive to focus. Uh, and elliptical sentences are just sort of a limiting case of that, a uh, very easy place to look for because there's, there's no distractors. Um, so uh, the point is that in running, in, in deciding that 67 is bad, we really need to look at, at 68 and, and provide a contrast there. All right, so I think that there's a structural difference between leapy ellipsis and sluicing. And I think that this structural difference is probably at least in part to blame for the, um, for the differences that we find in acceptability. So in 69, recall, this is the example of VP ellipsis with good VP, uh, good VP ellipsis with a voice mismatch. Um, the answer to this is, is actually only made available in the late 90s when people started pulling voice apart from the other pieces of the verb and assigning it to its own uh, head in the extended projection of the verb phrase. So um, one version of this uh, building on um, um, Kratzer's uh, work in 96 is something like 69 with a voice head. Um, Kratzer's was a, a little bit different from this um, and I've collapsed this little v's and you know other things that introduce arguments. But what I wanna say is that this set of facts gives us evidence that there is a voice head in English that it comes in, in at least two flavors, call them passive and active, that help determine the morphology as well as you know, other properties. Um, uh, but that the, this voice head is outside the ellipsis site in, uh, in VP ellipsis, uh, but inside it in, in, in sluicing. And this is compatible with a wide range of you know, people from um, Alexiadu and Schaefer and Anagnostopoulou to Bruning who have, looked at, um, who have looked at voice in the meantime. So what does this mean? This means that when you do VP ellipsis in 70, the problem has been looked into, but obviously nobody did, was to have been looked into, sorry. But obviously nobody did. What you're alighting is, is look into this problem. Um, the verb phrase here is not, uh, is not the same as, does not include the voice phrase. Um, can you see my, my little uh, um, arrow, Vera, or am I just? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought I was doing it for myself, but great. So if that's true, then the voice head is outside the ellipsis site and therefore doesn't participate in the resolution of ellipsis at all. Now that's, that move allows us to maintain strict identity between the, the two VPs that are alighted. I mean, the, the VP that's alighted and its antecedent. Um, but that move is not available for sluicing since you know, there is no way to sluice, to, in other words, to alight a clause without including the voice phrase. The voice phrase is just too low, it's always gonna be contained in the target of ellipsis. And therefore, under no circumstance will you be able to get um, a voice mismatch in sluicing. And that is explained in 72 versus 73, right? By whom Joe was murdered, um, it doesn't work. There's no way to get someone murdered Joe to license the ellipsis of Joe was murdered. And it's not about the auxiliary, you might think it was. I mean, that is also a mismatch. Um, this occurs also in languages. This set of facts is also found in languages with purely synthetic passives and actives. 
So schematically, here's the geometry. You get voice mismatch is allowed when it's low and doesn't ex and excludes voice, and it's disallowed when the target of ellipsis is high. Now, Kaler had already pointed out that there's a distinction between the, the good voice mismatches and those that were un, unacceptable, judged unacceptable, those SOG examples from the beginning. Um, and he, he had a very clever theory. He, what he pointed out was that in the cases that were good, you were dealing with some kind of a cause effect relation or other types of relations. But in the case that were bad, he, he posited a discourse relation called resemblance, where, um, which forced essentially additional constraints on the, on the structure and required that the voices match, right? Uh, which is what I say in, in point here. Now, what's interesting about Kaler's theory is this additional part, right? So he, he always believed that there was syntactic, I'm sorry, semantic identity required, but he said, when you have an ellipsis site in a resemblance relationship with its antecedent clause, then you also have to do syntactic identity. It was an additive theory of ellipsis. Um, there was really two theories. This is, this is really the first kind of hybrid theory of ellipsis that we'll come back to. Um, I just wanna flag it here. So um, now, if this is true, if this is all we're looking at is this, whether the, there's a resemblance relationship, then of course the effect should be the same no matter what the size of the ellipsis site is. And uh, you know, to Kaler's credit, he discovered this and, and created this theory. He only looked at verb phrase ellipsis. So he, he built a theory that said, these things should be out no matter what. Um, and they should be in as long as there's no resemblance relation. But we've just seen in sluicing that that doesn't seem to quite hold. And so I wanna show you some, um, uh, a set of experiments that, um, that shows that. A more recent work by one of his students, um, uh, Kurtz, Laura Kurtz, has claimed that all of these degradations, I and mean, there's a whole you know, a range of them that are, that are actually um, uh, gradient, are due to um, general or non-ellipsis specific constraints on information structure. This is a theory, this is an idea that goes back to Tancredi in which we should all endorse, which is if we're gonna do ellipsis identity, we should first, or at least be confident that we can exclude all the other things that are going on so that we're really just looking at ellipsis. Um, and so she comes up with a, a set of constraints on information structure and says, in fact, that covers everything. So there's nothing left for syntactic identity to do, in particular, trying to argue against Kaler's you know, additive piece. Uh, her prediction, of course, is that the effect should be the same in both elliptical and non-elliptical conditions because the whole point is that it's not ellipsis specific. So let me show you a set of examples, a set of ex uh, one ex experiment um, that was set up to test this prediction that looked at voice mismatches uh, these two discourse relations, resemblance versus cause effect, and what, what I'm calling here big versus small ellipses, which is in other words, BP ellipsis versus, uh, versus sluicing. This is an experiment um, that um, I carried out with uh, my colleague Ming Xiang a few years ago and a student of ours, Steve San Pietro. So what we did was we built ourselves a bunch of stimuli um, that, um, that varied along exactly these dimensions, right? So we looked at non-elliptical conditions that involved uh, large pieces and small pieces, uh, matching, mismatching, and resemblance and cause and effect. Um, and we ran an experiment asking uh, 51 uh, native speakers of English to rate these on a scale of one to seven. Um, and we did them both in non-elliptical conditions, the one that I just showed you, and elliptical ones. So uh, things like Jean was trying to sell her car, I know someone bought it, and Lisa knows who, and Lisa knows by who. Right, because she told me who, right? So we've got resemblance with and Lisa knows who, we've got cause and effect because she told me who, right? This is supposed to be the major um, distinction on, on these uh, information structure theories. Um, and also Lisa knows some, that someone did, and Lisa also knows that it was, right? So here we're doing, uh, we, we have to build at least two clauses in here to be able to really compare verb phrase ellipsis with, with sluicing, right? So that's why E, F, G, and H contain uh, two clauses and the verb phrase ellipsis in the second clause um, because we wanted to make it as parallel as possible with sluicing and we needed to um, have a, a, an embedding clause to get the sluicing to work. Well, here are the results. All right, you can see that <clears throat> on the bottom, let's start on the bottom. Non, the non-elliptical conditions were essentially all judged acceptable, right? So whatever's going on, even when you, 
whether it was cause and effect, whether there was a resemblance relationship or not, <clears throat> and whether there was matching or mismatching. So the effect for non-electrical structures were, was almost undetectable, and these, none of these are significant, um, which, is, which tells us one thing. It tells us that these information structure effects that Kaler posited are not, are not that strong or don't seem to be playing a very large role in um, non-electrical structures. Um, they may be playing some, um, and there's some, some very uh, interesting recent work by Jeff Geiger that looks at this, uh, but not enough to account for, uh, for the differences here. In the elliptical cases, what we find in, in all cases that the mismatches are worse. Now, on, this, on the left, I'm oh, sorry, the left side where I say is big, those are the sluices. So those are the really large differences between the, the matching ones uh, which are the light bars and the dark bars, which are much lower, and those are mismatching. Those were rated consistently lower in conformance with what the literature had said uh, are ungrammatical examples of mismatches and sluicing. If you turn to the to the upper right quadrant, this is the um, this is the verb phrase ellipsis cases, the small cases, in other words, and they involve both cause and effect and resemblance and matching and mismatching. So we see two things here. One, we we see evidence for Kaler's original observation, which was there is a difference between resemblance ones and cause and effect. The resemblance ones are like the SOG ones. Those are not good. Um, those are rated very poorly. They're rated almost on a par with the solution cases. The cause and effect ones are rated much better. So that's significantly better. Um, the other thing we noticed though, is that we're, the cause and effect ones are not rated at ceiling, right? There's still a, you know, a deprimation effect. Um, and that effect is unexplained essentially by everyone, but I'm pointing it out here in the interest of furthering, <laughs> stimulating further, further research. Um, but the, the main effect that we wanted to find was between um, v, VP ellipsis and sluicing, and we did find it, right? So overall, there's a significantly um, worse ratings for sluiced mismatches than there are for VP mismatches, and neither of those uh, worsenings uh, occur in uh, in the ellipti in the non-elliptical cases. All right. Um, there's another set of um, another way of thinking about whether we can detect syntax inside of an ellipsis site, and that comes from syntactic priming. Um, so this is from a, a recent paper, uh, again with Ming Xiang and a, a, a recently graduated student of ours, Julian Grove. Um, what we wanted to look at is uh, we wanted to use a well-known effect in the psycholinguistic literature to see whether or not we could de detect that effect or whether that effect could be triggered by elliptical sentences as well. So here, let me tell you a little bit about um, the effect. It's syntactic priming. Humans, English speakers in particular, but presumably other humans as well, uh, tend to um, be primed, that is tend to uh, process and produce structures um, in higher, uh, higher frequency if they've recently heard those structures or if they've heard them at some point in the past. The, 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 how long this effect lasts is, is, uh, is a subject of research. So here's an example. Bach in 1986 looked at um, the ditransitive alter alternation in English. Um, examples like Ralph sang Sheila a song versus Ralph sang a song to Sheila, right? And what she noticed is that, um, is that if you present uh, verbs like 75 to someone and then ask them to describe a picture um, with a different verb like hand, right? So if you think about Ralph handing Sheila a cookie, right? Or you can say Ralph handed a cookie to Sheila. Both of those are okay. And there's some, there's some base level of, uh, uh, of PP versus double NP double object structure for the verb hand, right? There's a lexical effect. Um, but if you first expose uh, people to verbs like, uh, sorry, to sentences like 75, they're going to start to use the ditransitive variant, the double object variant, in uh, a greater than uh, expected proportion and vice versa for, uh, for the PPs. Okay, so what we wanted to do is test the logic here is, can we get a triggering effect that is triggered not by the original verb, because we know that, that would just be replicating the original set of experiments, but rather by this verb. So how would we have to, so if there is truly a ditransitive double object here, uh, version of sing, then we might expect to find this second sentence um, priming uh, productions. 
Uh, and if there's not, we might not expect to find it. And likewise for PP. So in order to do this, we needed to look at ellipsis sentences, um, as well as two types of controls, the non-elliptical one, as well as a neutral control like um, an intransitive verb. So that's what we did. We created a bunch of, of these examples. The experiment ran like this. We took 82 speakers. Um, we recorded uh, uh, someone, me, re reading the sentence, uh, such as the ones I just gave you. We put them in a, uh, in a lab. They had to listen to the sentence that, um, that we recorded. They read the, uh, the prime sentence. And then they, we asked them to repeat the prime sentence. So we're really trying to prime, you know, prime a particular production. Then those things went away and we handed them a picture. We showed them a picture. In this case, um, a girl handing a boy, um, it looks like a, a paintbrush. And we said, could you please describe this picture? Now the verbs were not the same. We did tell them what verb to use for this, um, uh, but they were not the same as the ones in the primes. Um, so they were not just repeating the, the, the use of the verb that they had heard because they hadn't heard a use of that verb at all. Uh, when they produced, so this is what they produced. Remember, after a neutral sentence, we got essentially no priming from the first clause and the neutral sentence seems to have washed out that effect. Um, and we ended up with no particular uh, difference in the proportion um, uh, of PP versus NP double object uh, production, sorry. Um, when, we, when we repeated the, the non-elliptical story, this would be like double priming. So we're gonna say, you know, yeah, let me give you the example again, right? First, Ralph sang a song to Sheila, and then Marcus sang one to her. So now you've heard two examples with a PP, and you're asked to, to produce a sentence that describes this picture. What you do is you find that people overwhelmingly start, I mean, not overwhelmingly, but with, with greater than chance effect, uh, produce more NP, PP um, examples than they would have otherwise, right? That's what you'd expect. This is a priming effect right here in the middle. So the question that we're interested in is, what about the cases where the, the second sentence was elliptical? It was, it was, you know, do we get it? If, if there's no structure in that sentence at all, if there's no syntax there, then we might, affect, we might expect to find it behaving like the neutral sentence, right? With whatever priming effect being from the first clause, which is apparently washed out, not detectable here. Um, or is it like the second one where you have a repetition of the priming type structure? Well, I probably wouldn't be showing you this if the experiment hadn't worked out this way. What? What we found is that the ellipsis structures had a priming effect just like the non-elliptical ones. So these were behaving as though this, the, the, um, the subject had heard another uh, um, repetition of the, uh, in this case, the NPPP structure. They didn't, of course, because it was elliptical, but, they're, but apparently what they did was in, in unpacking that ellipsis, it re-triggered or reactivated or reused perhaps the exact structure that was in the antecedent in a way that the antecedent alone, as we see in the neutral case, was not a lot, uh, able to do. All right. Now, the last section that I want to talk to you about today is from head movement and verb stranding ellipsis. So this was really inspired by um, a whole group of arguments that, uh, that Vera has produced over the last few years um, from Russian verb stranding verb phrase ellipsis. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's really clever because it uses a whole bunch of kinds of objects and noun phrases and other, um, other things which are not plausible candidates for pro drop or other types of, um, of the normal kinds of argument ellipsis that we, or argument um, drop that we are, uh, or have been familiar with in the, in the literature. In particular, she used uh, noun, uh, negative polarity items, disjunctions, um, you know, generic noun phrases, some quantification ones, uh, and my favorite ones are the idiom chunk arguments um, in particular, uh, and showed that in, in Russian, you could get what looks like verb stranding ellipsis with these things in the antecedent. Um, and that makes, to my mind, a very strong uh, and compelling argument that what we're looking at in Russian is something very much like what we're looking at in Irish, module the differences in the syntax of the verb phrase in those two languages. Um, so this inspired me to look a little bit at um, one of my home languages here, Greek. And, um, and so I, I created a set of examples, which include 77. So 77 means, did Anna get her money back from the bank? Um, and what's interesting here is that pire, so there's a verb take, there's a subject, Iana, right? Um, there's uh, the object, Rimata, there's the PP source, Apotitrapeza, 
Apotindrapisa, sorry. And there's also this particle, piso, which means back. And um, a little bit like, uh, it behaves a lot like an adverb. It has positioning similar to adverbs in Greek. It has other syntactic um, features that remind us of adverbials in Greek. Uh, in particular, it can appear in whole, all sorts of different positions, like you see in 77, right? So you can say pire piso yana, or you can say pire yana piso klimata, or you can say pire yana klimata piso, etc. Um, this is obviously more um, has more positional um, uh, possibilities than than the English or um, or similar particle verbs in in other Germanic languages. But what's interesting to me is the is that if you ask a question like seventy seven, one of the possible answers. You can just say yes or no, obviously. But if you decide to do this verb stranding ellipsis, then the way you do it is in 78. Ne, pire. Right? What you don't say is ne, pire piso. So why is this interesting to me? Well, um, it's interesting because it seems to indicate that the structure of that answer is the, what you see in 79. You've got the verb take which has moved out of some extended projection of the verb phrase. I'm just calling little VP here. And it moves up into, let's call it the, the tense domain T. I'm not so interested in the, in, you know, the structure here. Please don't take me you know, at, at uh, face um, value here. So you've got some verb that originates inside the verb phrase. It licenses all these arguments, including this um, particle or adverb piso, and then it moves up into the T domain and it strands, I'm sorry, and it strands itself and everything else is subject to ellipsis. Now, this is exactly what you'd expect if all of these things stay internal to the verb phrase in, uh, in Greek. Now, some of them can move to the left. And in those cases, you could in fact get them surviving ellipsis, but if, they, if they're post-verbal, then this is, you know, this is where they are including this, this little adverb, which has to be VP uh, internal. It could have been here or here, or here, or here, but in any case, it appears inside the verb phrase. It does not move to the right. It's not a high attached uh, sentential adverb to right attached to the TP. It's inside the VP. Why is this interesting? Why do I keep on talking about this dumb adverb? It's because adverbs are just, they're really not the kinds of things that uh, are plausible candidates for you know, argument drop. Right. So I think this is an addition to Vera's set of arguments that there are things that are really hard to do argument drop to. And um, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, and yet it, it is uh, omittable in uh, a case where you get VP ellipsis. In other words, we have verb stranding ellipsis in a language like Greek as well. Another type of example that I think shows this very clearly is when we combine our, our the very first uh, set of examples uh, or type of evidence that I started out with, um, with this type of uh, uh, verb stranding ellipsis, that is WH movement of a, of a question phrase out of a, um, a target of ellipsis. So if you look at 80, 80 is a question with whom means literally with whom did Maria want to speak and with whom did Anna want? Um, that's literal, right? In English, we'd say with whom did Anna, which by itself is also a little bit weird because English doesn't like to do question extraction out of uh, VP ellipsis sites without a whole bunch of other things, but I don't want to go into that. Um, I'm not interested in the English. I'm interested in the Greek. And what's interesting here is that we have this verb ethele, which is want. It takes a subjunctive, uh, you know, tense finite clause, as it always does in Greek, which uh, itself has a verb in it, milisi, which is the verb speak, um, which selects or else selects the with whom phrase, right? So with whom here, this mepion has moved out of this. Let me show you this in this tree. Just, the tr all, tr almost fits on my screen. So mepion, with whom, starts out as the object or complement of milisi. It moves to the front, as you'd expect. Um, there's a head movement here that's not actually relevant, but uh, ethele, the verb want, starts here, it moves up. This is a control clause. I've, I, obviously, I'm suppressing all sorts of structure here about the na clause. Um, but there's a, there's, this is a finite clause, finite subjunctive clause um, that's underneath want. Want moves up, Anna can also move up and does in this case. Uh, and, um, and what we get is with whom wanted Anna. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that there's no plausible relation between uh, with whom and want, right? So if you're gonna base generate this in some relation to the verb, this is not gonna be your friendly neighborhood pseudo gapping, right? This is, this is the whole point is that with whom bears no relation to want. Want bears a relation, want is a relation between Anna and a set of propositions. 
and that proposition set of propositions includes the um, predicate speak, and that is the appropriate relation with Mayfield. So to account for this without positing any kind of ellipsis, I think it's gonna be extremely challenging. All right. And that brings me to the last part of, um, of today's presentation. Thank you for your patience. Um, and that comes from a set of facts that show that movement out of ellipsis sites interacts and informs our, our theory of identity. So I'm in particular wanna look at passives of intentional transitives or other things, um, things that can reconstruct for scope um, under modals, negation, quantificational adverbs, et cetera, for semantic reasons, right? We know that languages like English and lots of other languages that we can't just read semantic scope off of the uh, surface structure, right? So in classic examples of things like 82, a miracle would be needed or a miracle would be wanted. Take an intentional transitive verb like need, desire, want. It can take an object. That object is scopally dependent on need, right? So I need a miracle. I can say that without believing in miracles, right? Um, that's what it means to be an intentional transit. The, the indefinite a miracle takes narrow scope with respect to the intentionality introduced by the verb need when it's in its object position. And that's what distinguished need from verbs like I found a miracle or I received a miracle, right? If I tell you that, you know, you either, you get out your, <laughs> you, you start to have different thoughts about me. But I can certainly say a, a miracle would be need. Uh, sorry, I need a miracle. And what's interesting about these verbs, at least in English, many of them also allow for passives, right? So as you see in 82, and their properties don't change under passivization. Uh, 82a does not commit the speaker to the existence of miracles any more than the transitive version does. So a miracle would be needed for, for this analysis to work um, is perfectly utterable by someone who doesn't believe in miracles, right? Same thing for several magical beasts were hoped prayed, looked for by the children. Now, I can say that without believing that the children were gonna get lucky in finding any of them because hope for is a intentional transitive verb. And we find the same things with um, adverbs like often, right? Raspberries were often found in those days around the pond. <clears throat> There's a generic here. Um, it doesn't say generally there are, for things that are called raspberries, we often found them around the pond, but rather it, is, it was often the case that generally things that were raspberries were, we found around the pond. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so what's interesting is that you can take these verbs and you can use them in, in VP ellipsis cases. So you can say things like a unicorn was hoped for and a dragon was too, right? And raspberries were easily found, et cetera. Um, look at example 83E, uh, a quarry wasn't often stationed in such a temple, a kudos wasn't either. So Kori and Kudos, for those of you who don't remember your, your Greek art historian classes, um, Greek art history classes were um, figures of uh, statues of uh, girls and boys. So the Kori was the, was the girl and the Kudos was the boy found in lots of kinds of temple statuary. Um, the point is that in, in these two cases, so a unicorn in A and a Kori in, in E, is that uh, in A, for example, um, if you say a dragon was hoped for too, We've seen the properties of that. A dragon was too. We've now got an indefinite subject which has been moved out of uh, a VP ellipsis headed by a, an intentional transitive. And as we'd expect, if that's the case, a dragon, you know, is not um, uh, how is the, the the speaker of this sentence does not have to commit to the existence of dragons either, right? So it's still takes narrow scope. In fact, it, it has to take narrow scope. That's why I use intentional transits uh, on the, it, I should say, it has to take narrow scope in, in worlds that are consistent with people who don't believe in dragons. <laughs> Again, why I pick dragons, um, right? They're, these are scopely ambiguous per se, um, but given the fact that dragons don't exist, the, there's a, a huge preference for, uh, for normal um, hearers uh, to imagine that the scope is narrow because that means that I'm not crazy. Um, and something like 83E, right, again, I've, I've created this example so that the indefinite doesn't plausibly take scope over the negation and the, and the adverb, right? That would be a very weird reading to say something like there is a, a statue, X, such that X wasn't often stationed in such a temple. What, what does that mean? <laughs> that, that's a crazy thing to say. What, what, that's not what 83 is normally meant, it normally conveys, right? 83E normally conveys something like, uh, it's not often the case that there was such a statue in such a temple, that there was a statue corde in such a temple. And the elliptical version has the exact same properties. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the structures that we're interpreting 
I have to look like something like 84 and 86. Maybe it's a little easier to see here, right? So 84 is something like, there's a past tense, was hoped for a unicorn and was hoped for a dragon. And what's interesting here is that we need, we, we need this reconstruction or, uh, or scope interpretation uh, to make sense of the sentence, um, given again, the assumption that I, I don't believe in dragons. Um, and the same thing holds for 86 with respect to the adverb and negation, the, the quantificational adverb, temporal adverb and the negation, right? That's the meaning of the sentence in this context. Now, what's, why, why these sentences are so interesting is that they show under this, under most theories of, well, let me put it this way. Um, if you're someone like Irena Heim, uh, you are committed to a view that the, uh, the scopal properties are going to be read off something that's fairly transparent at LF. And that's what 84 to 86 are LFs that would be familiar in most um, uh, syntax semantics interface classes. Um, and they give rise to interpretations that are captured by the formulas in 85 uh, and 87 in a very regular way. That's what they're built to do. Um, what they also have, unfortunately, is the F marking. These are focus marked and they're focus marked inside of an ellipsis site. So for scopal properties, we know that they have to reconstruct. And yet there's a whole bunch of theories of ellipsis that say you can't possibly have focus marking inside an ellipsis site. That is true. You can't. Um, what you, but it's not quite true in the, in the way they mean it here, right? You can have F marking inside an ellipsis site. What you can't have is a pitch rise inside an ellipsis site. So the, the, the pitch rise that's associated with narrow focus in English obviously can't be realized when there's no segmental material to realize it on. So that, that, that's incompatible with trying to do a pitch rise inside an ellipsis site. That may be why, for example, we can't get focus associates of only inside of ellipsis sites. Perhaps only imposes a, a um, a uh, phonological requirement that it be followed by a pitch rise. Uh, but in any case, what you can get is semantic focus inside an ellipsis site, as long as these foci have something to contrast with. And then we get to ignore them. In other words, we get to um, type shift them out. And that is given to us by a Ruthian version of, of, a, of a constraint that I, that I proposed a long time ago um, in a short shieldian semantics, but it, it's equivalent here, which is to say that you can you can elide something if, um, I'm sorry, you can elide something only if uh, that something is, uh, conforms to 88. So is E given under the definition of 88? And the crucial part is that in both cases, the, antece the antecedent has to be an element of the focus alternative set of the elided material. And the elided material has to be an alternative, it has to be an element of the focus alternative set of the antecedent material. And that's exactly the case, even under reconstruction, for examples like uh, 84, where the elided material includes unicorn and dragon, those are the um, contrasting foci, and 86, where the elided material is a core and a kudos. Um, all right, so that's my final example. What that leads to, it leads us to a theory that I think is a, is a very nice one because it allows us to capture both the, the, the facts from BP ellipsis and sluicing, but more importantly, the facts from, um, from verb stranding ellipsis. And although I didn't, I'm not gonna give them to you here, um, the interesting thing that, that's come out since um, Vera's work on this is that there are many cases where the verbs themselves can contrast, but just in case they're focused. And that's compatible with a, with a theory like that. Um, the one case that has resisted all reanalysis so far is Irish, right? So Irish is the, is the original case of verb stranding ellipses, and it still remains, um, let's say, recalcitrant. Uh, it, it has resisted analysis um, because it seems quite, uh, it, it just seems to be a fact that McCloskey's original description of that is, is true, which is that you can't, um, focus contrast verbs in Irish. They have to be the same verb. Now that has given rise to a large set of, um, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of work that's tried to explain why that should be. Um, you know, the obvious uh, approaches are that for, for head stranding ellipsis or for verb stranding ellipsis in particular, the, the roots have to be the same. That, that's an original idea that um, I think goes back to Lotus Goldberg, but it's also one that is, impossible to make um, consistent uh, with um, the discoveries of, of uh, Gribanova um, and others. And 
And so we, we are left with a, between a rock and a hard place. There must be something special about Irish. And I would like to suggest that what's special about Irish is it has some very interesting prosodic properties that like English only um, is going to end up with the effect of not allowing you to put focus on a moved verb, right? And because you can't do that, you won't be able to satisfy the focus condition. And I leave that, I leave it to my friends in the Irish syntax semantics phonology community to see whether that actually works out. There's some, some interesting evidence from how particles work in the language that um, is, we've recently seen that uh, is at least consistent with that approach, but I can't claim that, um, that I have a reanalysis. So taking stock, I think, We've arrived at a world where um, the syntax of ellipsis has to be a syntax that we're familiar with. It can't be some totally sui generis terra incognita. It looks like the syntax that we're used to seeing with things that have pronunciations, thank God, right? That is really in one sense, the simplest possible world. Um, but that means that we have these you know, abstract structures. In other words, unpronounced nodes or entire syntactic structures with their usual properties and that we cannot um, retreat to surfacism. So with that, I will end and say thank you very much and be open to taking questions that Vera, I'm sure, has been collating or probably has herself. So thanks very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, sir. Uh, there have been some great questions through the chat, so I'll start there. Um, John P. has a question about uh, the voice mismatches. Specifically, he asks, is voice a feature? It seems that there's no unique morphological correlate that specifically marks English passives, i.e. neither auxiliary B or past participles specific to passives. So I think, um, I don't know, but I think it's probably a feature on a head and it's just been traditionally called voice uh, in English. Um, it, it triggers, you know, it, it must be involved in the production of what looks like a participle, the, the EN form, because that's what we use in, in English, um, but it also has other effects. So that's pretty much all I can, all I can say about that. I mean, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, Ben, ben Bruning has a, a lot of work on the English passive um, where he also makes use of a, of a separate head, Julie Leggett, you know, the, the whole book that I mentioned, um, the uh, Alexiadu on and, uh, uh and Schaefer book um, make use of this. So it, it's a, probably a feature on a head. Thanks. Um, and uh, so the next question comes from Rodrigo Ronero. It's a question I have also been worried about. Uh, he asks, how can strict syntactic identity theories account for um, Eric Potsdam's 2007 observation that the ellipsis site in Malagasy sluicing contains more structure than the antecedent. So specifically, he shows that Malagasy WH questions are pseudoclefts, the antecedent clause is a non-pseudocleft structure, while the ellipsis clause is a pseudocleft. Uh, and he uses this as an argument for a purely semantic identity condition. So this is one of the worrying, one of the worrying empirical findings for syntactic approaches, I, I suspect. It is absolutely worrying. I mean, you notice at the end, I didn't come back to those conditions. I mean, I think we're, I think we're in a hybrid world right now. Um, and the, if the chart that I started out with, with the two columns were extended, we'd end up with, with lots of examples. Um, we'd be able to add to both. Um, and I think that the next project should be to try to figure out just where the cracks are. Um, and that's what my, the whole, if you remember my title was why grand unified theory will never be found. I think at least in my mind, there are so many cases like Potsdam's that say, well, either the ellipsis condition in Malagasy is different. So that we give up on the grand unified vision uh, or, um, or there's, there are little bits and pieces that are unpronounced, but not because of ellipsis, right? That's always a possibility that somehow like English voice, like if you think about the affix stranding stuff, um, what, I've, what I've been saying for VP ellipsis in English is really that there's a voice head that's outside. Now, normally that would, be, that would be no good. It has nowhere to go. It's supposed to attach to a verb or trigger a set of morphological changes on the verb if the verb doesn't raise up into it. But so we have to, we have to already give up the stray affix filter in some way um, and say, well, there's other, you, well, you know more about this than I do. So, so my question always uh, looking at the Malagasy stuff was what, is there any way to make that work for the, um, 
for the ellipsis stuff. I'm not, you know, so is there any way to say, well, yeah, sure, it's a pseudo cleft, but all the pseudo clefty parts are really outside the ellipsis site and just triggering stuff inside that make that have the, the effect, right? <laughs> of course, the whole point of that paper was to show that that you don't get voice mismatch, right? I mean, I mean, sorry, that you you get what look like voice mismatch because the only thing you can extract in Malagasy is a subject, and the only way you can do that is by pseudo clefting and and you do get what look like um, uh, sluices over objects. So you can say things like, you know. Robbie saw someone, but I don't know who, but you can't say who did Robbie saw, who did Robbie see, right? You can only say, you know, something like, I don't even know how to say it, right? Who was the one that was seen by Robbie? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not a passive, but it's a, it's a voice alternation. And that was, um, yeah, that was Eric's point that you do get voice alternation. And it's a beautiful theory. Um, it means that we have to give up uh, our account for why voice alternations are, are bad in English. I mean, that, that's the puzzle. Like Eric's paper didn't, he didn't talk about the English cases. He just talked about the Malagasy. Fair enough. But I, yeah, now I'm just rambling on. No, so, there's a, a related set of questions I want to ask you, but I, I want to make sure we get to the questions asked by the audience first. And so um, actually Selena Rodriguez has a, has a question that is related to this. How can we tease apart genuine ellipsis from pseudo ellipsis, e.g. pseudo sluicing in Japanese? I think that's an, uh, a nice segue. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is, it's, it, you can't, I mean, it's hard, right? You have to rely on language specific features of those different constructions to try to figure out what's, what's going on. I think that's what, um, that's what people who work on Japanese have done, right? Um, to try to argue that there's no real sluicing there. But with the exception, of course, of recent work by Sato, who argues that it's just sluicing in situ. Um, and that, that may not, be as crazy as it sounds. I mean, you know, there's some recent work by Laura Stigliano who's claiming the same thing for, for examples in Spanish. Um, but in general, the, I mean, the point is great. It's that every, every language looks slightly different. So, you know, the work that um, Silene did uh, on Brazilian Portuguese and Spanish, right? That, that was very convincing. It sort of saved the analysis. It said, oh, look, these things are not, they're not what you thought they were. They're really um, clefts. And uh, of course, Spanish, you know, doesn't, and Brazilian Portuguese, I think, but Spanish for sure doesn't have a null copula. So you can't totally assimilate it to the, to the Japanese cases. But, you know, I, unfortunately, there's no general solution. But this is what makes we're going to listen so much fun. It's, it's, it's kind of like you've got a whole, you know, bag of candy and you get to like look at all these different languages and, and, um, and discover all sorts of new facts. Because ellipsis is the one thing that is just not in any, look, you work on agreement or, or you know, adverbials or tense or aspect, you're gonna open up a traditional grammar and you're gonna find something about that's of interest to you. Um, but for ellipsis, nothing. You know, a traditional grammar doesn't have anything about ellipsis, zero, almost nothing. And so you have to go and do the investigation yourself, which is really, you know, exciting. I agree. Um, and I think the, the question of, you know, whether something is a pseudo cleft underlyingly is important because it does force, I think, different types of conclusions potentially about identity effects. And that, and that will inform the theory of identity in, in ellipsis in an important way. Um, and um, the other thing I was thinking as you were talking is that, you know, the, the traditional theory, if you, if you think of a sluice as really underlyingly a WH question always, then, um, that, that approach does seem to make some typological predictions, which is that we should find sluicing in WH movement languages, but say not WH and C2 languages. And of course we find sluicing like things in WH and C2 languages all the time. And so I think there's an important question there, which is can those be analyzed away as being something else or, or do we have to go the way of, um, you know, realigning our understanding of what sluicing involves, whether it can be sort of um, done over something that is an in C2, WH and C2 string. I think your your work on Uzbek showed that it can. <laughs> uh, Andres uh, Saab has a question. Um, the facts in eighty two and eighty three show that when a movement uh, show then that a movement does reconstruct against several claims on the contrary in the literature. How can we uh, make this compatible with other existing evidence to the contrary? Yeah, so that's a great point, Andres, and I. Uh, one of the reasons I, I brought those examples up is because, because I've, I've been hearing this, you know, I, these claims about a movement not leaving traces for 20 years, maybe longer, I, th I think, since people in the, in the 90s made these claims. And I, at the time, I remember thinking like, 
but what about passives of intensive tr attentional transitives? I mean, what about all of the um, the A movement things for sub subject movement, right? The internal subject hypothesis, if those involve A movements over um, adverbs of quantification, modals, negation, all of those things, those don't in scopally interact the way, there's something special about arguments, right? They have scopal uh, possibilities that other things don't. And the way we've traditionally account for this by is by, recon by appealing to reconstruction for a movement. So I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't wanna be, I, I just think that, that it's contingent on anybody who wants to say that there's no a movement, uh, reconstruction for a movement to analyze how passives of intentional transits work, how you get the narrow scope reading for those. So I, I'm not trying to make it compatible. I'm, I'm basically putting it back into the, 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 the bag of the theorists and say, look, you owe us an explanation. If, you, if you're going to make a claim as radical as a movement doesn't leave a trace, you have to explain how all of these facts, and they're, they're you know, half a dozen, maybe more, um, are accounted for. Um, I want to turn now to a couple, a couple questions that I, I had as you were talking, but I want to encourage people to continue asking questions in the chat. If they have them, I will be checking it um, periodically. So um, one of the things I wanted to just comment on had to do with something you mentioned at, at the very end, which is that Irish is the remaining case that we know of that seems to defy explanation in terms of not allowing a mismatch on the verbs and, and um, your paper and Jim's festive sort of points to to a, to a way of understanding that fact that might have to do with the, the sort of prosody constraints on verb initial constructions in the language more generally, right? Um, but I just wanted to point out that there has been, I think, in, in largely in response to that set of observations, uh, some recent work that does point to there maybe being more languages like Irish than we thought. Um, so. Uh, Eva Portland has a Nails talk that shows that Lithuanian behaves like this. It, it does not allow mismatches um, in verb stranding ellipsis, but it allows them elsewhere. So in argument ellipsis, for example. Oh. Um, I've worked on I've worked on Uzbek and tried to show that yeah, there's no mismatch allowed there, there in those constructions either. So I, I think, but I guess uh, the open the open empirical question is is you know is Irish alone um a kind of alone in this kind of behavior is that a class of languages uh and that seems like an important question to me i, I hope people will work on it me yeah. too yeah no that's a great point i you know like i said i i love all these languages that do weird things uh, i think they help us well i mean i'm not, i don't want to be skeptical about a grand unified theory I, I want a grand unified theory right but on the other hand i i also am willing to be very patient uh, while we figure out what the actual facts are. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not, I don't want to exclude a whole set of facts just because I think theoretically they're, it's uncomfortable to think about them. Um, I'm, you know, it's one of these things where you wake up in the morning and you believe two impossible things before breakfast. Uh, you, to be a practicing linguist, you have to be willing to do that. We, we just have, you know, sets of incompatible domains of facts. And, um, you know, I'm just waiting for brilliant young colleagues to figure them all out. So uh, speaking of that, um, I, I have also been wondering as you were talking about, you know, the, um, something that came up sort of toward the end of the talk, which is like, well, okay, so what's then the identity condition about? Like we, we can show that there's syntax in the ellipsis. say we have this plethora of evidence for that. Um, does the identity relation care about the syntax and or to what degree does it care or how much of the syntax is it looking at? Like these are all things that are being very actively discussed right now. Um, some of the work coming out of the Santa Cruz sluicing project has really, I think, made us collectively reevaluate um, even what we believe for English. So um, work by Margaret Kroll and Dennis Rudin and, and Rodrigo Ranero's response to that work. Um, recently, there's like a, a, you know, a series of discussions, I think, around in, in sluicing in particular, um, yeah. these observations that, that we find more mismatches than we once expected. So voice mismatch, as you, as you mentioned, seems unacceptable, but there are various other types of mismatches, including things uh, things about polarity, mm -hmm. right? Polarity mismatches, yeah. and also um, and also various mo types of modal mismatches, where you have to sort of interpret a modal in the ellipsis site that was not an antecedent. What are yeah? What's the state? Of, what is the state of your thoughts about that <laughs> so uh, I, set of discussions? I love this work. I mean, I no, because the Santa Cruz project is great. I mean, it really, I think it's a it's a database that people should 
definitely use. Um, it's accessible. It's got, they did amazing work coding all of these naturally tested examples. You can search for all sorts of stuff. Uh, and the stuff that, that um, Kroll and Rudin, you know, and pulled out and others is really challenging, right? I mean, the Rudin, Rudin published a paper in LI where he talked about this notion of the eventive core being what's crucial, right? To exclude the uh, exclude uh, modality and negation. I think that's that's a promising thing. That's um, uh, other people have worked on that. Um, how do we make sense of what the eventive core is? I mean, that, that that's a cool idea. That that would be what's really crucial. Now, does that what does that tell us about the syntax of these things? Well, again, modality and negation and tense are things that are probably higher in the um, in the structure syntactically for in most languages than than things like voice and the the other argument alternations that are you know probably regulated by little d's or whatever is introducing you know, argument introducing heads that's those sort of alternations seem to be out right so that was what Rudin was trying to capture like what have there's some cutoff point um, but is that a syntactic cutoff point well you know if it's not we I think the we will definitely struggle to distinguish why voice is different from tense in that, in a semantic sense, right? I mean, it's just no, there's no natural theory that says tense and modality have to be in some higher, you know, or scopally superior position. Um, on the other hand, I mean, there are also things, look, if you were, if you were committed to a truly syntactic approach to everything and you wanted it to be just like voice, well, you would, you would do just what voice does. You would say, well, that's where you think modality and negation are, but they're really higher. They're much higher than you thought, and they're unpronounced in their higher positions. <laughs> so, so, um, so that's why the the realization of can and and not are just um, reflexes of agreement with some higher head. I mean, I, I, you know, for negation at least, that's exactly what Hedda Zylstra has claimed. Right, uh, that in fact, real negation is unpronounced and it's high up, and and the sentential negators that we find in lots of languages are in fact just agreement reflexes um, lower in the clause, and so and that's so that's specific, isn't it? Though I mean, that, that's going to vary from language to language. Yeah, so I I desperately want the Santa Cruz project to be to be extended by other people to other languages, right? Because that that's the question exactly. Do we find these same things? In other languages, maybe the negation is much lower in Turkish, for example, and or or we know there's two negations in Korean. Do they behave differently? I would love to. See that that would be great. Those are all great questions. I would love that too. Uh, there's a follow-up question from is it Silene or Silene? I'm sorry, I, I Rodriguez. Yeah. Um, uh, could the identity condition be reduced to a priming effect? The whole identity condition reduced to a priming effect. Ah. Wow, I never thought of it that way. That would be cool. Then we'd expect to find some variability, I think, because priming is is variable in that way, um, right? It doesn't it doesn't totally eliminate natural or baseline lexical um, distributions. It just sort of adds to them. I'll have to think about that. That would be that would be cool. Yeah. And it, it doesn't tell us whether it's syntax or semantics, because we get priming in both dimensions. So. Um, I want to go back to something that appeared in your paper on Greek, uh, which has to do with um, with the interaction of negation and adverbs in, in uh, verb starting ellipsis. And uh, so, so just to give some background, in, in English, VPE, if you do something like you bake the bread according to the recipe, and then somebody answers, no, we didn't, um, that's compatible with a reading where what he didn't do is bake the bread according to the recipe, but he baked it some other way, let's say. Um, so you can have a follow-up to those, like it came out really disgusting, for example, right? So um, that's English VPE. And then um, John Balin, I think, first showed this for, for Russian, and Idan Lando has recently uh, sort of generated the same argument for a whole series of languages, which, which are also sort of the ones where we argue about whether they're arguing ellipsis or verb-stranding ellipsis. Um, showing that if, if you do the same kind of thing, but the response contains a stranded negated verb, you don't get the adverbial reading inside the ellipsis. And I think that's true for Greek as well, isn't it? I, I think so. I don't remember yeah. what I said in the paper. I think that's what you said. Yeah. So you get, you know, he just, you get this reading where it's like, he just didn't bake the bread, period. Right. So you can't get the reading where what you're negating is associated with the, with the PP modifier and adverbial. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm, 
one, and so uh, one interesting observation is that you don't um, get that kind of effect for, for Irish, which of course doesn't have organ ellipsis of object or, or, or object drop. So it's a, really a genuine VC language and we don't have to argue about it for Irish. Um, and you know, the effect is just like English. So you get the reading that's compatible with the negating of the PP modifier or the, or the adverb or the adjunct that's inside the ellipsis site. But for the languages that have both, seem to have both an argument ellipsis type and a verb stranding ellipsis operation, maybe. Um, yeah, we seem to get this pattern that is mysterious. If verb stranding ellipsis is really available, you expect that adverbial thing to be inside the ellipsis site. The way that you show for, um, for take back, was it, for Greek? Right. I mean, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I've, I, I'm not sure what is going on in Greek entirely. I think what I, what puzzles me is that is that that reading is available in English the way it is. And uh, um, what I don't understand is the, the focus properties of association with negation, right? Because I think that that's, that's where I want to look for the differences. At least in the paper, I claim that the reason you didn't get that reading in Greek is because the focus association with negation in those cases would require that you get some kind of pitch rise on the adverb. And that's not possible. So you know, it's just not going to be there. You're only going to get the other reading, um, but he didn't bake the cake, right? Um, and so, but in English, apparently it is, even though we also get focus association with negation. And that's the puzzle. Like, why, why is it not required in English? What, what, is, what is going on with English? I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that English is a weird thing. Well, shall, I, shall I add something more alarming to the plate? Sure. I've had a recent um, set of exchanges with Ash Asha Petrashko, uh, who's now at Rochester, um, and and her um, our, our discussion was about Polish auxiliary straining VPE, and um, what she what she wrote to me is that you also don't get that interpretation for auxiliary straining VPE in Polish, huh. so, <laughs> and um, a, a similar set of effects is documented for for Lithuanian auxiliary straining VPE in that analysis paper that I um, just referenced earlier. So, well, that's so, interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. But it, so the, the immediate question is, well, how how does focus association with negation work in those languages? Like, language. What does it look like? Um, in, English is very weird. With some, we have we have very weird um, constraints on focus. Like the you know this thing with only, it's always bugged me that you can't you know John only wants to learn Spanish. That's fine, but you can't say what language does John only want to learn meaning what is the exclusive language such that X, such that John wants to learn X, right? Why not? Other languages allow that, right? I mean, you can move out of the association of with only um, in other languages or the equivalent of only, like in German. Um, we get backwards association. I really, you know, I would, I would, as always, I would claim that English is weird and we don't understand it nearly as much as we think we do. <laughs> um, but it's true that we, do, we need a theory of why, why focus association would be so much more constrained in precisely those languages that lack an English-like thing. But it's a little bit like asking why does English have preposition strain and no one else does. You know, we're, we're the odd man out. This is bizarre. I mean, it's not an answer, but yeah. On that note, uh, Rod <laughs> uh, Rodrigo Ranero has, has sent a question about um, your current thoughts on the empirical validity of the peace training generalization, mm -hmm. given uh, the apparent existence of several counterexamples of Arabic, uh, Indonesian, and Polish are the ones he mentioned. Oh, yeah. There are lots of counterexamples at this point. So at this point, I think it's up. I, what I said in, 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 in my book actually was, was that it was much worse in languages with highly um, high, um, uh, highly differentiated case marking systems, right? There seemed to me to be a difference between the Italian, the Romance languages on one hand, minus Romanian or standard Romanian at least, and you know German, Russian, Slavic, etc. Now Polish, of course, is the you know there's been a lot of work on Polish, um, much of it done in Chicago <laughs> that tried to show that you really couldn't that that wasn't a full explanation. I, I'm not sure what the full explanation is. Of course, the Indonesian work, I mean, that's Fortin's work. And, um, you know, that, that seems totally solid to me. I don't see any way around it. Um, and I also don't know if there's the kind of, you know, the Rodriguez Nevins and Vicente story, which could apply to those. It can't apply in Polish and it definitely, it could apply in, in, in uh, 
uh, in Arabic varieties, you know, lots of them involve some type of clefting structure for, uh, for at least for displaced WH phrases. Um, and I, but I don't know if it'll apply. I mean, the, the real puzzle is this recent work by Laura Stigliano, who's, you know, working on Spanish and shown that, you know, that, that, that hidden cleft structure story is not going to work all the time. And so we're left with a, um, you know, we're left with a residue. And th there was some really interesting work out of UCL too, um, on Greek, uh, a set of experiments um, by a student of Klaus Abel's there, who was also in, in Chicago for a, for a period. And, and what she really showed is that there, that it's gradient, that there's a, you know, obviously preposition stranding in Greek under WH is horrible. Pied piping is great. And sluicing without it, without the preposition is somewhere in between. That's the fact. So we're, it's not, you can't quite assimilate it in either direction. And I think right now we just don't have a good handle on, on how languages differ along those dimensions, what's influencing the judgments in those cases. But I, I definitely don't, I don't want to claim that, you know, the field hasn't changed since 2001. <laughs> we definitely know a lot more about that since 2001. So my current, my current thinking is it's, a, it's more complicated than I thought. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that's that's probably it for the questions. I should probably um, you ask you if you have any final remarks you want to make. No, I just you know thanks so much. I mean this is this is great. Uh, yeah, thank you again on behalf of of Avralina uh, Vivo, and um, we invite everyone to continue watching the series. And and thanks to Jason so much for for this very interesting discussion and for the talk. Yep. Thanks everybody. Thank you.